As you can tell, this is a little bit of a different format for us. We are in the sound booth. This is the sound booth that we showed in our studio tour. We got an uh, exciting one for you today. We're talking about the Inspire 3. We're doing more of a podcast format. We're just going to be casually chatting, talking about it. Me and Adam have been flying with it now for a year. So we've gotten some chance to really learn it a little bit more. And we wanted to talk about it. There's a lot of things to talk about. So we didn't want to confine it to just a very short video. But let it trail on a bit you know yeah and i can't i can't believe it's already been a whole year because i look back and a year ago we were still knee deep in the warehouse build look at this tough guy yo we're not making a huge mistake and we got the inspire 3 and i mean it's exciting but at the same time it's like oh my gosh when are we gonna find time to fly this and get to know this aircraft still it's been a good uh it's been a good experience we've enjoyed it so far um do we have some gripes? The reason that we're making this video is because you and I do have all of these years of flight experience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know how many hours at this point. We lost track, but it's been a lot because we started with uh, independently. I started on the original Phantom with the GoPro. Uh, and then when we started flying, it was the Inspire 1 with the, uh, this was just the original Inspire camera, which sucked. And then we immediately upgraded to the X5R, which was the clunkiest, it was like a camera just, with a little little SSD on it. You'd it start just, recording and the camera, the, the craft would be like flying like this and you do it. Like, <laughs> you could feel it as the control. Yeah, awful. that was, uh, yeah, that one had its issues. But yeah, so we've been flying for a long, long time with these mm -hmm. crafts. Uh, like I said, from the very beginning, and we've kind of been uh, along for the entire ride, which has been fun. Yeah. It's cool to see how far it's come. For people who are maybe watching our channel for the first time or aren't familiar with uh, Threefold. So we are, we're a video production company, kind of creative house, uh, do a lot of the con concepting, uh, pre-production, the production and post-production, uh, try to keep it in-house. And so Adam and I are not standalone um, we don't, we don't fly day in, day out, five days a week, right? Yep. That is not, you know, there are companies that do that who, you know, guys who are just in super deep with it. We kind of juggle other roles as well. There are some weeks where it's five days a week, day That in, day is out. true. Yeah, there definitely is days and weeks where that is the case, but uh, there's days where we're in the office editing too. Yeah. And It'd be kind of fun to do a, an episode about stories, just like stories of shoots with aerial stuff. Oh, yeah. Because we could, go, we could go on about that, too. We've flown them in every condition, uh, dusty, hot, super cold, where you're not sure if the craft should be flying in. Those heated batteries, man. Yep, what a lifesaver. Yep. Yep. You just <laughs> watch yeah. the temperature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. It's, it's crazy. But it makes it fun being able to fly in all these different environments and stories that we've had flying. It's, uh, there's a lot of them. And speaking of, uh, we're doing this actually just a day after we were just flying yesterday. We were out on a job uh, doing some agriculture uh, type drone shots for a client. And uh, so things are fresh on our mind. Yesterday was fun because it gave us an opportunity to really play with um, like the fine tuned tracking and just trying to match pace with objects that are variable. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was a little, a little different from a lot of the stuff that we've been able to capture with it in the past year. It's hard to look back and think like a year ago, what were we, what were we expecting with this craft when we got it? Um, I guess coming from the Inspire 2, you know, you expect that this craft is going to be it's going to handle very similarly to the Inspire 2. I remember coming from the Inspire 1 and then going to the Inspire 2 was you'd notice like a significant boost in performance. Mm -hmm. And I would say the Inspire 3 definitely has that, but the control of it is not floaty, but it's it's like you're driving a bigger craft, which it is. Yeah, I think, I, I think we were surprised when we first unpackaged it a year ago. Um, the size like yeah. it, it is oh it is a bigger craft and it's surprisingly light uh, which is another thing it's kind of amazing that they're keeping a similar size battery on it but it was a bigger overall craft it seemed like there was a massive jump from the first the very first original inspire one to the inspire two not the iterations yeah. in between yeah. and we noticed that and 
The Inspire 2 was still an amazing craft, but there was a lot of downsides with it that we were having frustrations with, with like yeah. the transmission consistency, the controllers were garbage, but we'll get to that later. Our expectations were high because again, it was like, we kind of debated right away, but we were like, we've held out for this. We need a good two person. The Mavic 3 does not suffice for what we're doing. Like we yeah. need a two person control and the Inspire 2 we've outgrown and we didn't want to upgrade to the X7 camera. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, at the price tag, we were like, okay, well, we expect it to be really refined. Well, I'm gonna take a step back because I wanna say that the price tag, like the biggest thing, the biggest expectation was like, the Inspire 1 to the Inspire 2 saw like a price tag increase, mm -hmm. but the Inspire 2 to the Inspire 3 saw a price tag increase. Like, Oh yeah, P. it was massive. Like yeah. the 1 to the 2, it added things like the FPV camera. It added a lot more features that it was like, okay, this is, it's a price bump, but it yeah. makes sense. The Inspire 3, like there is some world-class features on it that like no other craft has so mm -hmm. again it makes sense but you know it retained a lot of those things it was like it still has an fpv camera it has those things it was just like our expectation going to it was like we're waiting for inspire 3 waiting for the inspire 3 i think i expected like okay maybe eight to ten thousand dollar craft you know yeah. kitted out but i was not ready to see sixteen thousand dollars <laughs> it just was it was a little bit of a shock yeah i know. paid less for my car it almost seemed like it should have <laughs> yeah it almost <laughs> seemed like it should have uh been like a different class of drone because yeah. it, it did. I think like people who have flown Inspire 1, Inspire 2, and were waiting on the Inspire 3, all of a sudden, like when it was announced, took a step back and were like, well, this is clearly not a drone for me. But again, neither is the Mavic 3 necessarily. Mm -hmm. But Yeah, it's like you want a Mavic 3 with two-person operation. Like the Inspire 3 is very different from the first two, despite having the same name. Yeah, this is a category where um, it's hard to remember where things were a year ago because I remember like features came with the software and, and as of yesterday too, um, there was another software update available that I didn't push out yet, never push out something day of production. But it's it's both frustrating and really nice. I'll pull out a prop here, uh, not a propeller, like an actual physical prop. Like the controller is where you're running the software and yeah. then you have the firmware on the camera itself. And the software on the controller itself is very nice. Mm -hmm. But my biggest gripe is that it doesn't match the software that's on, say, the Mavic 3 Pro Cine yeah. controller. And that's, it's, it's very functionally different. There are a lot of very frustrating small bugs to the software. Uh, <laughs> there's still a lot of room for improvement, mm -hmm. like especially with Waypoint adding. Uh, the whole Waypoint process is is frustrating in a sense where it's kind of awkward. It's very awkward. Um, some of the tap targets in the user interface are also very, very small. Yeah. Like too small for a finger, or even if you had a stylus, it'd still be frustrating. Like they've got you've got a whole screen here, and and it'd be nice to be able to like work with that more mm -hmm. instead of having to really work your way around these finite um, buttons. Yeah. You know, we can say the same thing with like using the controller with the physical buttons on it. Yeah. Which is great. But you can't map all of the functions to every button. Like the D-pad buttons, you can't necessarily yeah, map. Yeah, limited. The, yeah. Like there's different yeah. classes of what you can actually assign to each one. Yeah. And for people who don't know, I mean, we have the Mavic. We had the Mavic 2 Pro or whichever one that was. Uh, we had that. We got the Mavic 3 Cine. Um, so, you know, we're flying with the Inspire 2 a lot of times, but there's times where either you or I need to go out and honestly, Inspire 2 or the Inspire 3 is overkill. Yeah. Like the Mavic 3 is, an, um, the Mavic 3 Cine is an amazing, Mavic 3 Pro Cine. There you go. Wow, what a mouthful. Right. Uh, is an insane camera uh, system, drone system um, for the size and the convenience factor. But yeah, it is. If you're bouncing between these, which I assume there's a lot of drone operators who again, like, the Inspire 2 is amazing two operator, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you're always operating with two people. Yeah. Uh, it is a pain in the butt bouncing between the two and the inconsistencies between them. Like you just want some consistency because yeah. again, obviously there is, you know, the Inspire 3 are meant for pros. Um, and then Mavic, it, you know, depending on where you're jumping in, because there's a bajillion different mm -hmm. uh, models. Like I get like some of those are just hobbyists. Yeah. So like, it needs to but i feel like at least with the pro line the cine line that's where you'd expect and want that software to be consistent with oh yeah inspire 3 um because that, yeah that's a huge frustration i understand why there's different software for different devices yeah. but being able to whether that's having like a pro mode or like a basic mode yeah and going between those two and then only having that 
on the pro controller that would be that would be yeah because they have they have different controller models for the mavic they sure do but i suppose if you buy the the pro 3 cine it comes with the top of the line controller but yeah it should just have that option then that seems strange but software wise it's a big step up going from the software and i wish that I would have had more experience with a crystal sky monitor um, and controller to be able to switch from that to this controller. Yeah, the apps were getting just kind of neglected, uh, which I understand that's a lot to maintain. Especially the Android version. Yeah, for Android and iOS to maintain it, it it makes sense. I think that this was the right move because we had so many hassles, whether it was, I mean, we even had issues with the iPad because we were using iPad, I was using Android, you were using iPhone. And like iPhone was always usually more consistent, but like we had problems with the iPad connecting and just like, it just was like not a good system. This type of system, like it's an expensive controller, but it's totally like, I think you'd agree, like it's been totally worth the investment of like, yeah, we're definitely gonna buy a second controller because the Inspire 3 does not come, the 16,000 only comes with one controller, but it's definitely worth the investment to get a second one just because of how good of a controller it is. It still has room for improvement that I would love to see, especially a lot of these bugs get ironed out, especially for a craft of this um, of this price point. Mm-hmm. That would be that would be it's like it's like these are things that need to be addressed, especially with uh, building waypoints, and um, and even getting RTA, RTK working. Um, and maybe that's you know that's part of the RTK unit's fault itself. But mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of frustrations and steps that could be easier, or uh, maybe the word I would use is. Um, not easier, but more intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Cause right now you do have to, you have to finagle your way around and mm-hmm. that's kind of frustrating, but overall really like the software, especially, uh, especially coming from the Inspire 2. Yeah. I'm curious to see, you know, with this being, knowing that it was a, uh, we were talking about it, like seven year gap between the Inspire oh 2 gosh. and Inspire 3 or 8 or whatever it was. It was long, yeah. which is crazy to think about. In the past, we have been I mean, you remember the original Ronin. Like, we were bought in on the original Ronin back in the day. And one thing that I would say that I've seen DJI do is you buy it for the features it has today. Yep. Y- you don't buy it with the expectation that it's like, oh, they're probably going to implement this in a software firmware. Yep. Like, because it doesn't seem to happen. Yeah. And, like, that even happened with the Inspire 2 to the point, like, obviously there was updates, but it's like, I think it was just bug fixes. Like, there was mm-hmm. never any new big features no. being pushed, which you know, honestly kind of got annoying because it was like, it f- almost forces you to like, feel like they're already over this product. Like they're oh, not, yeah. they're not going to release it. And so I hope that with something like this, with like this being such a like high end premium product, the Inspire 3, that there is firmware that gets pushed and f- not just firmware, but features. Like yeah. if there's more features that they can add, refine and build upon this craft. Cause if it's another seven to eight years before another one comes out, like there was features being added to like their Mavic series and the Inspire 2 is like sitting in the yep. corner and you're like, I, I was like a thousand dollar, the cheap thousand dollar drone getting these features, but like the Inspire 2 doesn't have any of this stuff. Yeah. So we'll see what, what happens with the software firmware side of things. Cause I, I hope that I, and honestly at the price point, I would expect that it should get some kind of some new features and hopefully they have a platform that's can kind of evolve over the next few years. How do you feel about talking about the, the camera? Ooh, yeah, I can talk about this. Um, well, for one, it's beautiful. The Mavic 3, uh, that's micro four thirds, which is what we were coming from on the Inspire 2 with the X5R, uh, X5S. The X5R was on the Inspire 1, I believe. Um, both of those were really nice because it was like a raw, you know, yeah. DNG image, like really beautiful looking image, but it was micro four thirds. So shooting with 24 50 on a micro four thirds and then all of a sudden we're jumping over to now full frame with 24 and 50 you know you you get really used to that focal length Mm -hmm. um and kind of your field of view that you have and so that was definitely a big adjustment but i will say the image quality from that 8k sensor is amazing uh it looks so good and um it's kind of funny because like I said, the Mavic 3 Pro Cine, uh, that's a micro four thirds and obviously great image too. But when we've intercut the two in the same project where we're using both of those drones, it becomes even more apparent how good that full frame sensor is. Yeah. Um, but I will say this is the one area as we were waiting and seeing what they did with the Rona 4D and the, um, you know, those cameras, I was so hoping to see, 
you know, being able to use one of those gimbal heads on the Inspire 3. Yeah, right. I get why they didn't, you know, from a flight times and the weight and all that kind of stuff with those having built-in NDs. Um, but that was kind of disappointing because I think as a production company, you know, I know there's a lot of companies out there, drone companies that they're not buying cameras, right? They're yeah. solely drone. That's what they do. Uh, so they could care less. But as a production company that does drone and, you know, other actual production stuff, that would have been a huge selling point of like, we're buying the Inspire 3 and we're going to get Ronin 4Ds now. Like knowing that we can interchange those camera systems would, would have been a huge selling point. Yeah. So that was kind of annoying. And like, I still don't, so it had to be the, you know, X9 Air or whatever um, camera, X8. What X, is it? It's the Zen Moose X9, isn't it? Okay, a nine. Air, I think is what it's yep. called because the other ones are just regular. Uh, I still don't understand why you can't buy a Ronin 4D body and slap our camera on it. Like, obviously, you wouldn't have the internal NDs, but, like, okay, why can't we at least have that option? Yeah. Um, so that's a little annoying because it's just, again, it's an expensive piece of gear, and it, it would be great to be able to get more use out of it. Um, but, again, I get why it had to be a different camera system. The one thing I will say, this is a little less related to the camera, the sensor. The limitation of the DL lenses kind of bums me out. They're yeah. part of the L mount now. Yep. I would love to see, like... And I, and I know that this would cut into flight time again, but I feel like the amount of weight that it would add would be marginal, would be see some of the L-mount lenses. Like Sigma has some really awesome L-mount, super compact lenses. I'd be like, mm -hmm. it'd be amazing to use those, especially because the tightest lens you can do right now is a 50 millimeter. Yeah. Which where, is, when is the, when is the yeah, 100 millimeter lens coming out? Where, yeah, where's the 85, the 105? Like that's a whole nother thing, but- Just put a doubler uh, on it. Yeah. And I know, and I shouldn't say, so there probably is, you know, I'm sure that you can adapt it and you can hack it out. I think uh, Make Art Now has done that with the Inspire stuff, but um, I wish we could have seen a little more lens compatibility because I feel just like being limited to just the DL lenses that DJI makes is kind of a bummer. The new zoom that they have, it's like a, um, what is it? 16 to 28, uh, I think that's what it is. 16 to 28 power zoom. That's a pretty big lens actually, Wide. but um, I mean, it would have been cool to see some zoom lens, even if it took a hit on the, the flight performance a little yeah. bit. Um, I would have loved to see more options with lenses, with third-party lenses, especially the people in the L-mount. Uh, I think that would have been cool, but the image itself is amazing. So I can't complain there. Yeah, and I think it's worth us mentioning that again, there are two cameras on this craft, the FPV and then the, yeah. the other controllable one. And the FPV camera is also a huge step up, especially in low light yeah, situations. Yeah, that is. The last Inspire 2 one was kind of a joke. Yeah, yeah. That thing was so bad. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> I mean, it was better than nothing, but it was bad. But you're also <laughs> stuck with, um, and I don't even think that one had upward 45 degrees. I think that one was straight negative 45 and then, yeah, any combination of those two. Yeah. But um, yeah, being able to articulate the FPV camera on this one in any direction is is really nice because there are times when your nose of the craft is down and you want to look upward more. Let's say you're flying underneath the power yeah. line um, and then your, your craft, you can't see up there. So then you really want to know where you're going and, and plan your safe flight out. Mm -hmm. um, being able to do that um, in a second nature because it's in the same position on the controller as it has been in the past for if you're operating camera at the same time. So if you come from, let's say flying the Mavic 3 as we've been talking about often today, if you come from flying that and then you go into the controlling position of the Inspire 3, it's just second nature to be able to use the uh, to be able to use the rotary yeah. joystick on the on the controller to yeah, be able to true. adjust where you're looking with the FPV camera. Another point on the um, FPV and the regular just the regular camera, you know, you're getting both those feeds, which is great. Yep. You know, obviously that you had that with Inspire 2 again. But uh, another thing that we were playing with just yesterday was the ability to output over you know the HDMI built into the controller, uh -huh. the you know full screen FPV clean feed. Uh, as well as the camera feed, yeah. which I think is really cool. I mean, it's it's little features like that that kind of tie back into the software that it's like that's a really great feature to have because yeah. as a, you know, typically you're flying it, but like as a pilot being able to have, you know, if you want a 20-inch screen to see that FPV yep. where it's just a clean feed and it's not cluttered with all the controls, mm -hmm. like you can do that. and yeah. Or you can do it for directors, monitors, send that out, Um there's a lot of those features that are really nice, but I thought that was pretty cool because you can even do picture in picture out of that HDMI yep. with either the FPV as the main one and then the camera feed in picture in picture or vice versa, which is sweet. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, we could probably talk about this all day, but 
especially if you are a remote pilot in command, and let's say you are not the person that's necessarily manipulating the controls, um, and you have visual observers and everything else. Yeah. But that lets you still be able to see the FPV camera of where the craft is and what the craft is going to be encountering. Mm -hmm. And then you, as somebody that is directing that mission, can really work with uh, work with your crew, uh, work with your flight crew. Yeah, personally on how... manipulating the controls. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that is really cool. It's a big safety feature that, um, you know, is really, really handy to have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, overall, I'm I'm happy with the cameras. I would have loved to see more compatibility. I mean, it's kind of appropriate because we were talking about being able to use the controller to output HDMI, yes. and this is the controllers in general, yeah. which these are amazing. Yeah. I will say, everything about these has been well, almost. Yeah, almost. There's a few gripes, but I will say, all in all, this is one of those things that. Um, truly made it the inspired 2 always felt like there was its quirks and kind of annoyances but all in all we put so many hours oh my gosh. on the inspired 2 and it it was such a reliable craft like yep. i said quirks with like the batteries kind of puffing up and um weird things like that but all in all like the craft felt really great but yeah. the the controllers every time i just wanted to like smash them on a rock because i, I hated them so much you started up and it would go beep 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 they were terrible which <laughs> these are amazing we got we, we originally only bought one because we have the DJI transmission system with the side handles. And there was that compatibility. And we we're like, okay, let's try this out. Compatibility. Yeah. It's super limited. Like there's really it not is. much you can do with it other than just you can pan tilt, which the joystick on those Ronin 40 handles is not great compared yeah. to being able to do with this. No, but the funny thing about those is that you can take the Mavic 2 controller spokes yeah. uh, from the thumbsticks and you can actually screw them into. Oh, the Ronin yeah. 40 yeah. handles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the Ronin, the, the panning tilting on those was terrible. There was no way to do autofocus. It was only manual focus, so you're always mm -hmm. pulling, which when you're flying a drone, there's a lot of shots you don't need to be pulling. You just want to know you're locked on with autofocus. Well, also with a wireless transmission, um, you're not going to always be able to tell if you are in focus or not, especially when you're you know 3,500 feet away. Yeah, exactly. That's where I think the tap to focus is a really great thing um, because you can screw yourself more often trying to pull focus because and then the image is soft because of transmission interference and uh, whatnot and so we quickly we all that to say we quickly learned that while the dji hybrid monitor in theory may have been a great idea or it could be as a second gimbal operator controller it was terrible i hated it uh, because i'm typically controlling gimbal uh, but this one is amazing from i mean the controls, the screen, the high bright screen, the, I think one of my favorite things I didn't think I'd love as much as I did is the body support. Me too. And the harness. That is honestly so nice because the amount of times I'd have to just find a place to sit or, and you could buy stuff, but I like that this is kind of more, uh, you know, straight from DJI and you have to buy this separate from the controller, but totally worth it. Uh, that is so nice. The redundant battery system is amazing. Um, just everything about this controller is like so well thought out. Almost. Yeah. There's a difference between Caleb's controller and the one that I'm holding here. Yeah. Show them? Let's show. The one big problem, the antenna broke. Not twice. just once. Yeah, twice. Uh, this is my little gripe that I have with them. So, I, you know, there's this, this is a pro level drone. So you expect with a pro level drone, you, there's maintenance, right? Yep. Like routine maintenance that you need to do. Yep. You should have it's access. It's been a year, so yeah. now we need to replace the props. And that's yep. literally in the maintenance yeah. manual. Um, but parts, this is the parts of this. This is where it's frustrating. So the first one broke. There's this plastic. It's For one, it's plastic. But for this being kind of, I mean, it's an antenna. It's always sticking out and folds in. Yep. But it's, it's, a, it's a piece that has a high probability to break. Um, Which I would, I assume that's an engineered failure, failure point. Yeah. Like you don't want your controller itself to snap, yeah. so that snaps instead. So that makes sense, and that's fine. But when it broke, I could not find an antenna. Like I couldn't find an antenna anywhere for it. Nope. People are going to be making fun of me for antenna because I guess I say it weird in another video. Antenna, antenna, potato, potato. Nobody says potato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, some <laughs> crazy people do. I've heard people yeah. say it. But it broke. I could not find a replacement, so I had to email them. They were actually nice enough to like just cover it and send us two replacement antennas. And um, we got it, and it broke again already. We lost the other one somehow, but there's still no option to just buy them. Like yeah. they're cheap and they're, they're cheap. Like I they're eighteen dollars. Yeah, but pair. now I have to go through support again, email them, go, hey, can I get another, you know, set? And 
Uh, it just seems kind of like a, I don't know. It seems a little cheap for the controller and how much these are at 1600 bucks. Again, like you said, having kind of engineered break points on them, that's fine, but uh, something that they should have in their shop. Well, I wonder if anybody else has broken more antennas than us. Yeah, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's a Caleb problem because you haven't broken any. I've only broke two, but uh, all in all, you know, other than that one minor complaint, these, these have been so amazing to use. Yeah. I've really enjoyed it. It's nice having a dedicated screen and system to, um, you know, use this. I think they, they feel amazing. The size is great. There's really not many complaints. And then the other feature we haven't talked about is, um, and this is something we haven't yeah. had to use much, but uh, this ability to hand over control. Mm -hmm. I think that's so amazing. Like uh, such a brilliant little way to, again, add safety to flying because I mean, that's that's really always paramount when you are flying. It's, yep. it's something you want to keep in mind. And I think those little features and functions that are sometimes more of minor features or they're not as highlighted are really big, big selling points to why we're, we're flying with an Inspire 3 and not a custom made drone because yeah. again, of those little things. And it's also not just used by the Inspire 3. Which is cool because that it's, uh, I'm glad to see that it's more standardized across all their kind of high-end drones. Yeah, and uh, I think that kind of, you know, a big part about this is that there's two batteries in the controller. The batteries are a huge part of your accessories. You only have the TB-51s as options for yeah. the actual aircraft. These little batteries, they're kind of fun. We don't really use them other than, we don't use them with the Hybrite. It's kind of weird. I just wish that they would have gone with like, this isn't like a really important, it's, I understand why DJI has their own batteries for their drones. Yeah. That's really important, right? But with this, it's like, why not just use an NP battery? I don't know why they had to do their own for the- Yeah, can I see that actually? Yeah. So this is used in their controllers. It's used in their um, Hybrite monitors and their transmission systems. Um, it's just kind of annoying. More from the standpoint of, I don't want more batteries than I need to have, you yeah. know? Like I don't want a thousand different types of batteries. I just want to standardize it. It's also funny because this is 7.6 volts and you know what else? I'm pretty sure the FP series is in, in that range as well for its voltage outputs, isn't it? Yeah. It's like- I, I think, yeah, NPF batteries. Or that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah it is. Um, and even if it's one of those things, I would, I would still prefer this to be an NPF style battery and then have very limited compatibility yeah. in terms of like, no, you have to use these specific brands because yep. we're not going to let you use some cheap, you know, third party. Very reasonable. You know, I would be fine with that where it's like, it won't let you use it unless it's a nicer one. But uh, when, when you have Deity and you have Blackmagic and all of these other companies supporting NP batteries, we'll see how they hold up over time. They still, yeah. they still do fine in the cold. Um, and I forgot to talk about this when we were talking about like the software part of it, but being able to see your craft's power and how much it's it's drawing from the batteries at any yeah. given moment is nice to know when you need to uh, slow down your throttle to help the batteries as well because mm. then you can be a little easier on them as a pilot yeah i think this is one of those things where you are not you know you have 200 watt hour batter 200 watt hours worth of capacity on on your craft and you are drawing, I mean, you're using up 200 watt hours in a matter of 30 minutes, yeah. which is a crazy amount of power draw from a battery. Obviously that's hard on a battery. You know, that's that's not to say we we don't have the expectation that these batteries need to go, you know, hundreds and thousands of cycles, you know, they're gonna be less, but um, I, yeah, I think the price tag of just 350 was just a little, little bit more than we were expecting. It is a lot to put on any aircraft though, and um, yeah. They're working good so far. They they'll are. give a status report if they start swelling up like the TB50s did yeah. though. But after a year, they're fine. Yeah, yeah, one year in, I'd say that's pretty good. Something else that we've that we've gotten into over the course of the last year, and, and we don't own all of the accessories yet, but we have the RTK station, and we've yeah. started playing with that over the course of a year. And we're not, you know, right now with the RTK station, we're not using like the millimeter level of precision where you can, you know, set your move and then follow your move exactly using the, the... Yeah, we're not using the, I'm trying to remember the term for yeah. it, but it's basically like a dolly track in the air yep. functionality. We're, we're doing it as some recorded waypoint uh, where we need some accuracy. Like super accurate. It connected okay the first time. I kind of fumbled through it, but eventually it got it connected. It took a little bit for it to kind of get all its GPS signals connected and whatnot but i think more than that it was it's very cryptic in like the way that you set it up yeah it, it seems like it could have been a little more uh user friendly with like 
It's like, hold this button for five seconds and then click three times. And it's just like, yeah. can, we, like can we just have it a little more straightforward? <laughs> in terms of other accessories, I mean, I think we kind of have everything. You know, like I said, we originally only had the one controller because we were using a Hybrite, which super limited. A little disappointing for that. I think as a director's feed, it's fine. Um, but as a second camera operator, gimbal operator, it's pretty uh, inefficient. Um, so we have the second controller, we bought some more batteries along the way. And I think the Inspire 3 is sitting in a spot now where it's like, if they didn't update it for 10 years, I get it. You know, like it feels future proofed. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if there's more accessories or things that they come out to help continue to evolve the Inspire 3 uh, as it ages and keep the value proposition high for the Inspire 3. So we'll just have to wait and see for that. Yeah. And, you know, just as far as accessories go, I think that we'll be trying like the Focus Assist. What is is yeah, that what it's called? Yeah, DJI Focus, Focus Pro, Pro Assist? Yeah, something like that. We Matt, have it coming Pro from Pro 3 Cine system. Assist. Yeah, Focus Pro 3 Cine Assist Pro 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 Pro. Uh, yeah, if we have that coming in the mail uh, for the ground unit, that it, that piece gets me more excited for the ground unit yeah. aspect with the DJI transmission and everything, uh, the actual transmitters. Uh, but we'll have to try it with the Inspire as well. We talk about how the Inspire 2, we that that was we used it for seven years, six, five to seven years, yeah, which is insane. And you get used to like this idea of this craft, and you get used to seeing it in the, in, in the sky. Mm -hmm. And I just want to talk about the Inspire 3 in the air. Mm -hmm. When you are flying and you're watching it, if you are used to the visual profile of the Inspire 1 or Inspire 2 in the air, which 10 years of flying those crafts, yeah, insane to think about, but like. 10 years of flying those crafts, used to seeing it as a certain way. And the Inspire 3 looks backwards. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at it and you think that your your nose is pointing towards you, your craft is actually pointing away from you. Yeah. If you're used to that profile in the sky or the silhouette. That's not that's there's nothing wrong with the craft in that regard. That's just yeah. as a pilot, that really took me a, 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 as a remote pilot. That took me by surprise. Yeah, I can't say much to it because I don't look at the craft that much. I'm look, looking at sure. the camera, but uh yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, in terms of differences between the Inspire 2 and Inspire 3. Um, they fixed quick spin finally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that was always like a weird bug. Well, it wasn't a weird bug, and then it was a weird bug where, yeah, yeah your control sensitivity after quick spin would hit, it would be incredibly sensitive. And you'd turn, try to turn a little bit, and it would just, it would just go. Yeah. That is now fixed, thankfully. So, like, controlling it is a lot easier. But, like, mm. in the air, I think this craft handles really well. The real test will be in five, six years yeah. after we've been flying it to see how it's held up and yep. any issues. But if it's anything like the Inspire 2, I think it's going to be an amazing craft. Yeah. And this craft definitely feels like it and it definitely flies like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, it's more like a yacht in the sky. Like yeah. wind can hit it and it, you're not going to, you're not, you will feel it, mm -hmm. but it's not going to push you away. Like yeah. the craft can handle it for sure. And I'm assuming that's also helping you as a camera operator because yeah. um, our shots look very clean and stable. Yeah. Yeah. Touching on that, like the uh, Inspire 2, like I said, it was really great, but it had quirks. One of those quirks was like constantly, you know, you do gimbal calibrations, all that. But when we were doing big moves where uh, I was having to pan the camera yeah. and do like a big pan, say like, you know, 90 or 180 degrees, you were constantly having to compensate roll because roll would start to, sh mm -hmm. to, to shift. Um, so you're, you know, you're, in addition to trying to do a pan tilt, you're also like fine tuning roll and trying to make that roll adjustment to keep the horizon level yeah. all while pan tilting and trying to do it so that the rolling isn't noticeable, which was, it made it a lot more difficult to capture shots where now with the Inspire 3, I know that was one of the things when they touted, they were like, you know, we fixed it. Like there's more sensors, uh, technical stuff. I don't quite understand that kind of basically makes that issue no more. Yeah. Uh, and I can say that that has been a thing. It's like thinking about roll now on this craft is not a thing on the gimbal, which is amazing because it's just like the horizon's always spot on. Yeah. It's always level. Uh, again, we've talked a lot about like uh, nitpicking little things because yeah. it's always easy to talk about nitpicking little things. But all in all, like we've gotten away and every time we fly, we're like this craft is so refined. Yeah. Like, and it is, it really is refined. And there's so many little details uh, that make flying and operating with it uh, so nice. And I think 
another thing to think about is, you know, you get used to it, mm-hmm. right? I think if we would go back to any other craft, like the Inspire 2 or uh, who knows, I don't I don't even know of any other brands. But like if you go to other crafts, I think it would become so so obvious so quickly, yeah. all the pain points. But I think you get used to having these features that you kind of forget about them, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and I, mean, I think one of the big features that I really like that I haven't talked about at all and I should have talked about it back in the software section, but that's the augmented reality portion of the software. Because mm. you talk about the role and all of the extra sensors and everything. And when you're flying, it will actually show you your horizon line. And as you as the craft turns, the horizon line, it'll, it'll continue mm, to yeah. match where it is. So you can actually like see and plan how you're flying the craft through the air with that. But then in addition to that, and this is something that is new to was it 2022 2023 that it had that it was enabled is the remote id on an aircraft yeah that's been working amazing yeah having that transponder in the craft is incredible for two reasons first is that it'll just it'll alert you when Mm -hmm. there's nearby aircraft but then on top of that it'll actually show you where that aircraft is on your display being able to see that in real time is just amazing because it's it's something that i'm always really really cautious about that and birds um, <laughs> yeah. birds do not like the Inspire 3. They don't like any <laughs> aircraft. But yeah, yeah those that, that is really cool because, yeah, that was a good example yesterday of where, you know, we got to see it in action. And that yeah. wasn't the first time, but, yeah, every time it's like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I think yesterday was the first time when I, like, had my camera tilted up far enough to actually yeah. be like, oh, there's an airplane up there. Yeah. Be like, oh, my gosh, I've never seen that happen in real life. That's so cool. Like, yeah. Because it always alerts you, and it, it'll keep alerting you, yeah. too, which I love. But yeah Uh, overall i'm really happy with that with the part of the software package with that yeah i would uh you know one thing i don't quite understand that i'd love to see this this seems like a software implementation um the codec options so there's there's a raw license which again we get get why that needs to be a thing um but the options for ProRes, it's kind of annoying that you're limited to just 422HQ. Uh, I think it would be nice to just have the option to do LT. Here's a real pipe dream. Uh, but, you know, with the RAW, ProRes RAW, we edit in Resolve. Yep. There's no compatibility easily being able to import it. So, like, for us, getting the RAW license is, well, do we want to deal with converting ProRes RAW or deal with Cinema DNG, which is massive files yep. and we did deal with cinema dng with the previous x5s uh with the raw license but that was because it had pro it had like strange problems with the ProRes. yeah we were getting it. like weird flicker things where we had to switch to um raw but i mean the images were, were amazing yeah. but again it was just like you'd fill up a make so fast you'd have to you wouldn't have to convert it um but you'd want to for long-term storage sake because it would take up so much and i don't think there's any option for something like b-raw or any other compressed raw codec maybe now that uh nikon bought red there'll be some more options maybe (laughs) we'll see the ProRes still is great like i said the image is amazing but i think having a nice 12-bit uh raw option would be great that isn't ProRes raw or cinema dng yeah it's like we'll pay we'll pay for it too yeah just but give us more reasons to rip open that velcro wallet yeah. That's oh, uh, one thing we did not talk about. The way that the batteries pop out. Oh, yeah. It feels like you're going to break those tabs every time. So when the batteries are inserted and you push the buttons, it just feels like something's going to snap every time. Like, yeah. I like that it's a secure fit, but uh, I feel like I'm about to damage the craft every time. And I'm sure it's they, there's plenty of testing that went in to make sure it was, you know, it's not going to snap, but it just feels like something's you know oh on top of that is when you're putting them back in like you really have to shove them yeah, to get it oh, past yeah. that latch which to be fair i don't want the batteries popping out <laughs> yeah either. that is i would rather it be a tough latch mm-hmm. but again it was there's a middle ground here somewhere i think every time we have to like swap batteries we're like oh my gosh this latch yeah you know exactly when the battery is coming out like you yeah. know when that latch is activated but you don't always know if the battery is all the way in yeah so it is it does feel pretty soft when you're putting it back in mm-hmm um, the other thing we didn't talk about is the obstacle avoidance with it, which we've had, there's annoyances with it, but I think they did a nice job. You can tweak it more mm-hmm. um, and you can make adjustments to it, which is great. But I think I think just having it is a really nice peace of mind thing. Yep. It's, it's great in the fact that you know it's there. You don't have to worry about like if you're going to 
be flying straight into something. I haven't had any false positives yet. Mm. Um, I'm, I should take that back. We might have had one or two, but they weren't memorable for me. I remember with the Inspire 2, there were a lot of collision detection issues with the sun. It, yeah, the sun. Yep. It would pick up, you know, the sun, whether that's any point in the horizon, it could be high noon and it would still pick it up and occasionally have issues in the middle of the air. Mm -hmm. And I'd be afraid that like I missed a power line or something that I didn't see. But um, the Inspire 3 does really well with that. Um, I wish, I really wish that it had better sensitivity with it because when you start getting closer to the ground, then it starts really reducing your speed unless you turn it completely off. You know, I'm thinking about this. It's like, man, we are missing so many little features. I think it's one of those things when you're in it, controlling it, and we're, we're out flying. There's so many things that mm -hmm. you're thinking of or that you see. Uh, but then when we sit down, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I need, I like, want the controller. I want the craft in front of me, you know. Yeah. So I feel like we we definitely missed a lot, but I think hopefully we hit some good points. Hopefully we gave people perspective to, uh, if you're looking at the Inspire 3, uh, yeah. kind of our experience with it. I will say, again, it's like, to, to sum it up, it's like, man, it is, we went in with high expectations and we haven't been disappointed yet. Yep. It is a insanely refined craft that I feel so safe flying. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important with, with doing drone work. Absolutely. So. Anyways, with that, thank you guys for watching. We appreciate you. Uh, if you've made it this far, well, congratulations. You have stuck through it uh, and listened to me and Adam ramble for probably way too long on an Inspire. Uh, but yeah, thank you for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe. If you did not, just remember, if you don't hit subscribe, you may never see our videos again. We'll see you guys in the next video.